and uh, we have an interesting session on mimickers and masquerades in ophthalmology. Can I invite all my co-speakers to please come up uh, in the front? Uh, Dr. Neetu, please join me here on the panel. Uh, Dr. Divya. So, uh, without much ado, we will start the talk. Uh, I'll Speaking first on amblyopia, uh, mimickers, uh, and masquerades. So, what's a mimicker and what's a masquerader? So, I think I will clarify this first before moving on to the topic first. So an ophthalmic mimicker is usually a lesser known disease which closely resembles a familiar ophthalmic disease and confuses the clinical, clinician. For example, uh, you know, a cataract which can masquerade as, uh, uh, as a squint or a you know, retinal pathology which can masquerade as a squint. Whereas a masquerader is usually a dangerous disease which can disguise as an innocuous condition. Just like that, for example, retinoblastoma masquerading as a squint. So that is, uh, I'd like to say, this is what is a mimicker and a masquerader. So we're going to look at some amblyopia mimickers. So let's look at this case scenario of a 19-year-old healthy girl. She was accidentally noticed to have blurry vision during a driving license test six months back. She had consulted elsewhere and was extensively evaluated and was told that she was probably having a refractive error with amblyopia and even the possibility of malingering because her visual acuity was 6 by 24 N6, not improving further with glasses or pinhole. So when we saw her, uh, with, we, she had uh, a normal ocular alignment. She had good binocular vision for, as Wordsworth daughter showed fusion but stereopsis was just about borderline, 200 arc seconds. Pupils were good, there was no RAPD, color vision was full in both eyes. And this was a fundus. It essentially looked normal to us initially. And uh, we actually uh, had a cursive glance to the OCT. It didn't really ring a bell then. We did a visual fields. She had bilateral central scotoma. It was repeated, again, bilateral central scotoma a pattern VP, full field DRG, EOG, all were within normal limits. So let's, we thought we'll have a closer look at her OCT and, uh, and also at her multicolor picture. You could see there were this small yellowish white retinal flex, a suspicion, not even flex, some deposits at the macula. And the fundus autofluorescence was very dramatic. She had this, uh, uh, you know, hyper, out of fluorescence on FAF. And that's when we thought, let's look at the macula closely. And we found that she had some amount of foveal atrophy with ISOS junction disruption, which was the re And this raised the strong suspicion of, are we really dealing with an amblyopia, or is there a structural problem? And then we thought, this could be an early macula dystrophy. So that's when we did an MFERG. And you can see here, there is reduced foveal peak in the right eye. And the foveal peak in the left eye is absent. So then we thought of doing a genetic analysis. And to a surprise, we got an ABCA4 mutation, came out as positive. And this ABCA4 is, uh, you know, it is indicated in Stargardt's disease and ABCA4 retinopathy. So probably we were dealing with a case of ABCA4 retinopathy or an early Stargardt's. So that goes the importance of doing a detailed evaluation. So next was this 15-year-old 10th standard student, again was referred for screen surgery. He was diagnosed to have strabismic amblyopia. He had a right exotropia, resistant to patching and glasses. When I saw him first, I thought he was relatively short-statured for his age. He was cushionoid, baby-faced. For a 15-year-old, he really looked underage. So 
Then I looked into his fundus. This was his fundus, bilateral optic disc pallor. We did an OCT. There was definitely retinal nerve fiber layer thinning in both eyes, right more than left. And uh, something was not right. I did the fields. This is the field I got, bitemporal hemianopia. So definitely he must be having something. And we imaged him. And this is what we got. He had a large pituitary macroadenoma, which was compressing his uh, chasm as well as the right optic nerve. And that was the reason for his right uh, both bilateral optic atrophy, right more than left, and him going into an exotropia. So he was referred to the neurosurgeon. He underwent uh, a surgical excision, but I think he continues to have poor vision in the right eye. The third case was again referred as an isometropic amblyopia, a seven-year-old healthy boy, best corrected visual acuity, not improving beyond 612, 618, no history of consanguinity, no similar illness in the family, color vision was... Uh, poor. This is his fundus. Opto's picture initially looked good. I couldn't find any abnormality. But there was something in the history. His father was saying he's stumbling at objects at night. That was the catchy thing. So we did an ERG. And you can see here the photopic responses are all good. But look at the uh, scotopic or the dark adapted responses. Uh, even you have a negative B wave here. So can you see this is the A wave and where you are supposed to have the B wave, it is a negative B wave. So that uh, thought brought us to the suspicion, are we dealing with the case of night blindness? And uh, that's when we did the genetic analysis and he came out positive for uh, the TRPM, that is the transretinal uh, you know, protein mutation positive. So that is again very... Uh, you know, points to the diagnosis of congenital stationary night blindness. This is another case of an eight-year-old boy. Again, had poor vision. Right eye, fairly okay, 612, N6. Left eye, CF2 meters, N36. Compound hy hypermetropic astigmatism, diagnosed as an isometropic amblyopia. Uh, right eye was okay. Left eye had some patches of subretinal. Uh, fibrosis and you can see these uh, pigmentary changes he definitely had a pathology in the left eye and on a closer look you could see this shytic areas which was beautifully delineated in the OCT and this turned out to be a case of juvenile X-linked retinoschisis with a bicycle spoke wheel maculopathy. Another case referred to us as refractory ametropic amblyopia 11 year old boy difficulty in vision squeezing eyes and again, he had compound myopic astigmatism, no history of consanguinity. Fundus essentially looked normal to us. But the red flags in the history were poor vision, poor color vision. He was squeezing his eyes even in the room light in my OPD. Fine nystagmus and sister having similar complaints. Again, an ERG was done. And you can see here, the scotopic responses are very good. But look at the photopic responses. The light responses are totally absent. So this, again, we did a genetic analysis and the CNGA3 gene came out as positive. So this was a case of achromatopsia. Again, this girl was referred as uh, amblyopia, poor vision, myopia. Fundus looked normal, except that I couldn't get the foveal reflex. So she had poor vision, nystagmus, photophobia, no foveal contour on OCT. So this was highly suspicious of foveal hyperplasia and we are evaluating her. So there are a lot of literature search, uh, you know, uh, evidence for um, mimickers and masquerades of amblyopia. We had a similar case of a child referred for squint surgery, eventually turned out to have a brain seen as glioma. It was masquerading as an esotropia. So what I want to say is that we have to rule out before you think of amblyopia, get a detailed history, establish an amblyogenic risk factor before you label as amblyopia, rule out an organic cause and do ancillary investigations, image whenever, wherever necessary, electrophysiology does help, and genetic tests clinches it. All that does not see well is not always amblyopia. Thank you. Now, now I invite uh, Dr. Neetu Mohan. Uh, she's the senior consultant and head of the Department of Glaucoma in Arvind Daike System, Chennai, to talk on potential mimickers of glaucoma. Thank you, Nina, for the opportunity to be here in KSOS and uh, the chance to meet up with old friends and most respected teachers here. 
That was a fantastic collection of cases that we saw there, beautifully documented. So I'll be talking about potential mimickers of glaucoma. So we will discuss this under two headings. One is the open angle glaucomas, where as you know, a diagnosis of glaucoma is made by the characteristic appearance of the disc and the field changes that you are going to see. So a number of conditions which can cause similar changes to the disc or RNFL or the fields can be confused with glaucoma. With open angle glaucomas, what you are most concerned about is about missing a diagnosis which is a neuroophthalmological cause for cupping. So we'll discuss this and then we'll also cover congenital conditions, retinal diseases, some others like high myopes, disease asymmetry and toxic neuropathies. Angle closure glaucomas, mimics of angle closure glaucoma, though not so common, these patients are acutely symptomatic and you are pressed to make a diagnosis immediately and to go on with the treatment. So we'll discuss a few of these two. So coming to mimickers of open angle glaucoma, neuroophthalmological disorders. This is a 82 year old gentleman on follow up with us for past six to seven years. He's a known case of primary open angle glaucoma. Over a period of seven years, we have stepped up the anti-glaucoma medications. He's on three medications currently. And these are his fields over the years. You can see his fields were persist, like, uh, relatively stable over the years. And here on the fifth field, we see what was at that point of time diagnosed as progression in the field effects. And anti-glaucoma medications were stepped up. But then three months later, when we repeated a field, this seemed to look more like a vertical hemianopia now. So this made the uh, consultant ask for further investigations and the MRI at that point of time showed an old right PCA tertiary infarct which was probably missed earlier. So what are the points that tells you that this is not glaucoma, you have to pursue this further and look for another cause. Most importantly would be the history. When there is a sudden onset visual loss or when there are other symptomatology which suggests a neurologic pathology, you have to pursue it further. A young patient with normal intraocular pressures is not glaucoma unless all other diagnoses are ruled out. In a young patient diagnosed as NTG, a diurnal variation, neuroimaging is a must. And even if a diagnosis of glaucoma is made, this patient should undergo sleep study, ocular blood flow analysis and carotid Doppler to rule out the risk factors for NTG in young patients. A drop in visual acuity and color vision points to a diagnosis which is away from glaucoma. Please pick up the pen torch, look at the pupil, a relative efferent pupillary defect that does not correspond to the amount of cupping that is expected in glaucoma points to a diagnosis which is something else. The classical teaching of pallor more than cupping still holds good. But having said that, any uh, IOP spike, even in an angle closure glaucoma or a pseudo exfoliation glaucoma, when you have an acute rise in IOP, this itself can cause a disc pallor. So be guarded about just going by disc pallor. Perimetry, as mentioned, vertical hemianopia, central and centrocecal scotomas are a diagnosis away from glaucoma. And in OCT, you would see more of temporal RNFL thinning and diffuse RNFL thinning in neurological disorders, as opposed to glaucoma, where you would see superior and inferior RNFL loss. So coming to the congenital conditions, Optic disc colobomas, optic disc pits and tilted discs are very often confused with glaucoma and since many of these conditions coexist with high myopia, it is very difficult to at that point of time make a diagnosis of glaucoma. It is good to have baseline perimetry and fundus photographs in this, these patients. OCT RNFL whenever it is possible to good, get a good image and follow these patients over time to just prove that these changes are not progressing over time or in many cases the conditions may just coexist. Glaucoma and an optic disc pit can coexist. So this is one patient on follow up with us for a long time. She had superior segmental optic nerve hypoplasia or the topless disc syndrome, characteristic superior disc pallor, superior peripapillary scleral halo. You can see these diffuse RNFL defects superiorly which what's uh, this corresponding changes in OCT RNFL and we have a perfect field which corresponds to the OCT with an inferior altitudinal uh, field effect and we were following her up over a period of time and then due to COVID she was lost to follow up for two years and then when she came back we were surprised to see a drastic progression in fields over a period of two years 
And then apparently SSOH is also a risk factor for normal tension glaucoma in young patients. The impaired retinal development during fetal period might cause vulnerabilities to the optic disc and retina, which predisposes these patients to NTG. So currently, she has been started on an anti-glaucoma medication, even though her diurnal variation and IOP were also normal. Morning glory anomaly is not very often missed since this characteristic disc appearance is striking, but these patients need neuroimaging to rule out the systemic associations. Coming to retinal diseases, it is important to know that a rim sloping or pallor or even a retinal nerve fiber layer defect, as you can see here, a characteristic RNFL defect is seen inferiorly, but you can also see sheathing of the vessels there. This is an old retinal vein occlusion, a branch retinal vein occlusion, which has been lasered. So any pathology which causes a ganglion cell loss will also cause an RNFL defect or even rim sloping and pallor. So in the presence of a coexisting pathology, it is good to have baseline investigations and follow these patients up over a period of time, especially if the intraocular pressure is normal, rather than brand them as glaucoma. Coming to other disorders, disc size asymmetry is one of the commonest reasons why a patient gets branded as a glaucoma suspect in spite of a normal perimetry and OCT. So when you see a patient with a normal intraocular pressure, normal OCT, and normal perimetry, go back and look at the disc size because this is something we don't always look at. We always look at the rim and sloping and focal defects, but disc size is something we tend to miss in a routine practice. Axial myopia itself is a risk factor for primary open angle glaucoma. Perimetry is fraught with many artifacts because of the enlarged blind spots and arcuate scotomas can be present even in tilted discs. OCT in these patients, again, it is quite difficult to get a good OCT image in these patients. And even when you get a good OCT image, as you can see in this patient, you can see there is a temporal shifting of the retinal nerve fiber layer peaks. Though you have the superior and inferior peaks there, they are a little shifted temporarily because of which uh, there is a red disease showing up in the OCT, whereas actually this patient is has a normal perimetry and the clinically also the disc is normal with a normal intraocular pressure. So fundus photographs and visual fields are a good way of following up these patients very closely. Mimickers of angle closure glaucoma, anterior uveitis versus acute angle closure glaucoma, we often discuss and we are clear about this. There is a characteristic history of colored halos, shallow AC, mid-dilated pupil, glaucom flecken, all point towards a diagnosis of acute angle closure. What is more tricky is when you have secondary angle closure due to uveitis, and you have to distinguish this from primary angle closure disease, especially when it presents bilaterally. Can I take a minute, Nina? Yeah. So if there is a history of photophobia, keratic precipitates, and presence of cells and flare, posterior sinica, presence of a meiotic rather than a mid-dilated pupil, it is worthwhile investigating these patients further by a B-scan or a UBM, where you may pick up peripheral choroidal detachments, and it is important to have a high index of suspicion for this since the treatment pro protocol for these two conditions are very different. You do not want to end up doing a YAC PI in a patient who already has a uveitis. Congenital glaucoma is beyond the scope of this uh, talk, but any, any of the symptomatology of congenital glaucoma can be, can be confused with other disorders because these patients are definitely not being able to cooperate for a complete examination. So don't go by a single parameter. Do the complete set of investigations for congenital glaucoma in all these patients and follow them up over time. So to conclude, be cautious about diagnosing the presence or absence of glaucoma based on a single parameter and consider the entire clinical picture from the vision to the pupil to the anterior chamber reaction to the fundus photos to fields to perimetry and OCT and the UBM and B-scan as and when necessary. That's it. Thank you. So next I invite uh, Dr. Thomas Aaron Vergis to speak on uh, optic neuritis, mimickers, and masqueraders. Good afternoon. At the outset, I'd like to thank KSOS and Dr. Nina for this opportunity. So many cases, we think, especially young female, we think it's optic neuritis. But sometimes we, a detailed examination will tell you that the cause is something quite different. 
I acknowledge my mentor in neuroophthalmology, Mr. Barr, and every case look upon like a case of Sherlock Holmes. So these are different cases of optic dysedema, and only the one on the left, middle left, is optic neuritis. All the others were very different etiologies. And we'll go through these one by one. So history, examination, investigations are very useful. History, you use your ears. Examination, you use your eyes. And then you use what is between your ears to find, come to the diagnosis. Approach to dyskedema, you, use, you can use, these are your tools. And uh, as I said, additional symptoms uh, give you a big clue. Differentiate true versus pseudo dyskedema. Unilateral versus bilateral. As you know, in optic neuritis, usually it's a unilateral presentation. So mainly cases of unilateral dyskedema would become in your differentials. Don't forget blood pressure, general examination. I'm feeling the temporal artery here, any fullness of temporal fossa, and additional features. So true versus pseudo dyskedema, that's the first thing you need to differentiate. So the two most useful Cs, the color, cup, contour, circulation, and complete retina. The cup, as you know, in true edema, it goes late, while it lost early in, it is absent very often in pseudo dyskedema, and circulation, the Cs. The blood vessels are usually very clearly seen in pseudo dyskedema. And as I said, typically optic neuritis, you're thinking of unilateral causes like posterior scleritis, uveitis, AION, neuroretinitis, and compressive lesions. And very un unusually, bilateral cause, those causes which present usually bilaterally may start in one eye and then in the other eye. So I am a clinical person. I mainly look at additional features in the examination. For example, a pale optic disc is, indicates an AION. And additional features like a macular fan indicates a neuroretinitis. If there's associated choroiditis, you're thinking TB. If there's associated proptosis, it can be very mild, you're thinking an orbital mass. Extreme severe pain generally indicates an optic uh, posterior scleritis, and I'll show you examples of these. So this is a lady I saw when working in the UK, three weeks, blurring of vision left eye. You can see the disc edema. And she also had the fullness of the temporal fossa. And that indicated um, a bony lesion. And that was very beautifully seen on the CT scan, which showed a fibrous dysplasia. So a general survey of the patient will give you important clues as to the possible cause. Again, a 35-year-old who present with blurring in the right eye. But you see the other features. You see the extensive cotton wool spots. That indicates a systemic cause. And it's actually due to hypertension. This is a very interesting patient, you know, typical optic neuritis age group, 29-year-old with disc edema. And you can see she had a doubtful choroidal elevation infronasally. So I evaluated for tuberculosis, MANTU. And she came back, when she came back with the MANTU, she had developed a new lesion. You can see here, suprotemporally, and there's a subretinal abscess. So that indicated possible tuberculosis, and we started ATT, and she had a very good outcome with the ATT. So, although the typical optic neuritis age group, it was a very good decision not to back her on IV methylprednisolone for three days. So, uveitis, what should, the important clue was the antidebitrious cells and the small choroidal elevation. Again, a 40-year-old presented with blurring in the right eye. You can see the disc edema and some pallor. But you examine the other eye. It's almost like a chronic papilledema. Almost like you have the typical champagne cork appearance. So this was actually an AION in a papilledema. So when they, in an AIO, in a chronic papilledema, they develop a compartment syndrome leading to AION and sudden worsening of vision, which can simulate an optic neuritis. A 65-year-old who presented with blurring in the left eye, again, you can see this disc edema in the left eye, but the other eye examination showed pallor. So you had pallor optic atrophy on one side and disc edema on the other side. And this is a case of Foster Kennedy syndrome. So even though the present symptoms is in the left eye, very important to always examine the opposite eye, which gives you important clues. Very interesting patient here, 39 year old, presented with severe headache and pain and photophobia. Actually, I was not even able to examine the fundus at the first visit because of the marked photophobia. Gave topical steroids for a few days. Came back in three days. I was just about able to examine the fundus and take this photograph, which showed a disc edema in the right eye. And her pain was sort of out of proportion to the congestion. So I was suspecting a posterior scleritis, which it, which it turned out to be with the B scan. But the story did not end there. 
we gave obviously high dose systemic steroids and she responded. So disc edema with severe pain, you're thinking posterior scleritis. But the story, as I said, did not end there. She came in 2019 with some complaint in the left eye. And you can see an exudative retinal detachment. Again, we gave her systemic steroids and that settled down. And at that point, examination of the right eye showed a sunset fundus. So this was actually a VKH presenting with posterior scleritis, but presenting first as a disc edema. And four years down the line, we got the diagnosis of VKH. And again, the exudative retinal detachment settled very well with systemic steroids. A 16-year-old, 11th standard student, presented with some pain, blurring, and she had features of pan uveitis, anterior and posterior inflammation, and bilateral disc edema. So we're thinking sarcoidosis, TB toxoplasmosis, ACE was very high, and she was started on systemic steroids, responded initially. She even developed a facial palsy. She, she phoned me one day and said, my face looks a bit funny, and sent me this photograph. So she had developed a facial palsy. Again, we increased the systemic steroids. She even developed new vessels on the disc. We did a PRP, and finally, she is doing very well. So started off with the disc edema, but additional features. So always the additional clinical features gives you important clues. The uveitis features suspect, sus suspected sarcoidosis and TB and gave a good result. Last patient here, 31 year old. He had a present with some blurring. He's a professional driver. And uh, actually he actually didn't think anything wrong with his eyes. He got married during the COVID time and his brother-in-law who was watching the wedding online said, your eyes look a bit funny. You better go and see an eye specialist. And he came, you can see, there's a disc edema on the right side and a mild proptosis. And so disc edema plus proptosis indicates an orbital lesion and he had a cavernous hemangioma. And Dr. Marian operated him and you can see he's done, a, done very well. So take home message, detailed history, focus examination, differentiate true versus pseudo, unilateral versus bilateral, look for additional features. There will be some additional features which will help you differentiate from a typical optic neuritis. Systemic examination, blood pressure, don't forget, and investigations, blood and imaging where necessary will give you the diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas Sarun. Uh, Dr. Thomas Sarun Vergis is a very senior consultant uh, working in Cochin at many hospitals uh, with special interest in neuroophthalmology and glaucoma. So now, uh, let me call upon uh, Dr. Divya Balakrishnan to speak on uveitic masquerade syndromes. Dr. Divya is a senior consultant in vitreo retina at Little Flower Hospital, Angamali. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Nina and KSOS for having me here. So my topic is uveitis masquerade syndromes. Uh, these are a group of various ocular disease that mimic chronic intraocular inflammation. But actually, these are non-inflammatory cells, like uh, blood malignant cells or pigments, which are secondary to some underlying non-inflammatory disease. So these can be either neoplastic or non-neoplastic. So uh, some of the neoplastic conditions which may present like uveitis, the common ones being uh, primary intraocular lymphoma, leukemia, uveal melanoma, retinoblastoma, metastatic lesions, and paraneoplastic syndromes. So while making a diagnosis, ocular pathology is found to be one of the most important thing which helps in diagnosing these uh, neoplastic masquerade syndrome. Now coming to non-neoplastic uh, uveitis syndrome, uh, the common ones being like retinal detachment, uh, sometimes uh, uh, missed intraocular foreign bodies, persistent cortical matter. It could be drug induced or like underlying retinal vascular diseases. And multimodal imaging is the one which gives us a clue to uh, detect the underlying pathology. And whenever there is an uh, involvement of the optic disc or a retinal vessel, that gives a clue that the patient might be having a systemic disease. I'll give you examples of neoplastic uveitis syndromes. So this was an elderly patient who present with a sudden decrease in vision. And uh, the patient on presentation had this uh, uh, picture. Actually, the right eye had as a uh, hemorrhagic or a blood-stained uh, hyperpion, and the left eye had hyperpion. Because of this dramatic presentation with no history of trauma, 
uh, uh, suspicion of something uh, beyond what we are seeing was there. So the patient underwent an AC tech and the sample was sent for both the micro and pathology. And this is what the sample, sh sample showed that there was myeloblast. So this, the blood stain hypopion and the uh, mild heterochromia was the one which made us think something beyond. This was another case where a 14-year-old boy presented with a decrease in vision and headache. On examination, anterior segment was normal, but fundus showed multiple uh, pockets of uh, neurosensory detachment or subretinal fluid was there. So uh, seeing the first, we thought it could be a VKH, and uh, the patient was sent for OCT and uh, fundus fluorescent angiogram. OCT showed neurosensory detachment with few hyperreflective dots uh, beneath. And fundus fluorescein angiogram actually did not show any hot disk, except for some few uh, hyperfluorescence in the late phases. So seeing this, we thought it doesn't look like a typical VKH, investigated the child, and the peripheral smear examination showed there was 75% of blast cells, and further investigations revealed an underlying diagnosis of a B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So leukemia can present like neurosensory detachment, what we see, saw in the other case, it may present like hypopion. And when you see an already known a case of leukemia patient present with this hypopion, think of a blast crisis or a CNS involvement. In children, when they present with this loose white hypopion with a white eye especially, think there is something beyond. And uh, they, it may be a manifestation of retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma can even present like an endophthalmitis also. So this was a two-year-old kid with a history of fall, had sustained lit tear, had got operated for the lit tear and conjunctival tear and was referred as a case of traumatic end of thalmitis. So when the kid was in, I don't have the uh, slit lamp photo or the uh, anterior photo, but it was looking similar to the first case with that hemorrhagic hypopair. So a B scan was done. B scan showed anyway uh, vitreous echoes was there. There was increase in the RC thickening. So a diagnosis of traumatic endophthalmitis was made. Patient child was posted for vitrectomy. While doing vitrectomy, the surgeon found that something was abnormal in the vitreous. It was not looking like a typical end of. Sample was sent for pathology and microbiology. It turned out to be a case of retinoblastoma. So trauma history in children, always be careful. Re-evaluate the imaging, especially B-scan, and take a proper history. There might be something beyond what we are seeing. This is another case where the patient was treated as a case of ocular tuberculosis, presented with the uh, hypopian uveitis. The fundus picture, it showed vitritis. There was yellowish subretinal lesions and infiltrating onto the disc, actually. We can see the disc hemorrhages. A closer look at the lesions, can, you can see that there is yellow, uh, orange yellow infiltrates subretinal and this looks like leopard spots and the other eye when we examined had multiple sub rp lesions the b scan again showed heterogeneous diffuse lesions infiltrating onto the disc the oct actually you can see there is uh, uh, outer layer hyperreflectivity of the retina and nodular appearance of rp and these hyperreflectivity of the rp and the subretinal infiltrates when you see this nodularity of the rp always keep in your mind a differential of lymphoma so this turned out to be uh, vitreo retinal lymphoma. And whenever you treat any patient with anterior or intermediate uveitis not responding to your treatment, then keep uh, lymphoma in your differential diagnosis. And when you plan for a biopsy, always make sure that you wean off the patient of your steroids for at least two weeks before planning for biopsy. This was another case which was reported, again treated as idiopathic choroiditis. See, you can, because of that yellowish white lesion at the fovea, patient initially treated with steroids, showed mild response, but later presented with history of seizures. During that time, a neuroimaging and further bone marrow aspirate revealed that the patient was actually having primary CNS lymphoma. So these OCT feature actually with this RPE nodularity or a hyperreflectivity at the level of the RPE and subretinal always keep your antenna up to see whether you are missing out on something. And this is a known case of uh, CA breast patient presented with bilateral subretinal yellowish lesions. And because of this history, the patient was subjected to PET scan. And this turned out to be a metastasis, uh, widespread with liver, bone, and choroid meds. So these are few cases of neoplastic. Some non-neoplastic uveitis masqueroids. This was a, a, a patient present with a sudden decrease in vision, bilateral vision, PL. And you can see the anterior segment, there is uh, congestion and significant choroidal edema, uh, corneal edema uh, with fibrinous membrane uh, in both eyes precluding the fundus view. And uh, so this case was actually uh, referred elsewhere as cases of acute ankle closure glaucoma was planned for YAG-PA. 
uh, because there was no fundus view, it showed like uh, there was a peripheral choroidal detachment in both eyes. And when we uh, took the history, actually the patient was recently started on topiramide. So with the history of the drug, in, uh, uh, the patient, with consultation with the neurophysician, the drug was stopped and the patient was started on topical and systemic steroids and this is how it responded. And this is another case which reported the patient, a retropositive child on uh, antiretroviral therapy, started on rifabutin, clarithromycin and ethambutol and this kind of hypopion UATs, can, you can get it in these cases. Uh, this is a case uh, which uh, is a man mentally challenged uh, uh, child who was uh, treated as UVATs for two months uh, with complicated cataract and posterior sinicae. When we saw, we did a B scan. The right eye was a closed funnel RD and this is the anterior segment of the left eye. The B scan was showing again retinal detachment. So we operated this child. The child is mobile now. So whenever you see anterior UVATs, just make, po make a point that you see the fundus, you might be missing a regmatogenous retinal detachment behind. So in these cases actually, especially when you see a bloodstain hyperpion or a hyperreflective RPE, have a high index of suspicion. Especially when you are treating cases refractory to your uh, uveitis, refractory to your treatment or short some initial response and then resistant to treatment, always revisit the history, look at your investigations again if you are missing out anything. So a multimodal imaging and uh, with the neuroimaging, with the vitreous biopsy or ACTAP, subjecting to, uh, especially if you are not getting any diagnosis, please subject the sample to all these cytopathology, immunohistochemistry, flow cytometry, cytokine analysis, and now the molecular next generation sequencing, you might get something. So thank you. So don't miss on any life-threatening or uh, what vision-threatening conditions. So thank you, uh, Divya, for that uh, beautiful illustrative case series of masquerades and uh, uveitis. So now we have next Dr. Lekha T. She's a senior consul consultant in uh, retina at Giridhara Institute, Kochi, and she will be speaking to us on central serous retinopathy mimickers. Thank you, Dr. Nina and Scientific Committee of KSOS. Central serous retinopathy or CSR is a very common condition that we see in our clinical practice. Usually seen in the age group of 20 to 50 years, they come with complaints of central scotoma or metamorphopsia. Fundus examination reveals pocket of fluid and OCT confirms the fluid apart from that shows, might show a pigment epithelial detachment and features of pachychoroid. Depending on the chronicity, it can be acute or chronic. So this is a 46-year-old lady with blurred vision since one month. She had similar complaints earlier. Fundus examination showed SRF over the macula, and uh, which was confirmed on OCT. You can also notice a small double layer sign. And fundus fluorescein angiography showed small two pinpoint leaks, which progressively increased in the subsequent phases, showing a typical ink blot and a smokestack leak, confirming our diagnosis of acute recurrent CSR. So as we have been already hearing in the previous talks, multimodal imaging is very useful to come to a proper diagnosis for classification, for planning our treatment, as well as in the follow-up. We have a 45-year-old male here who is a known case of CSR in the past. He came with a recent decrease in vision, and you can see there was some amount of fluid with significant RP changes, more in the right eye than in the left eye. OCT, it is more of a shallow detachment with more widespread RP changes, which can be made out on FFA also. Along with that, there were leaks which were seen in both eyes. So these are the features when you see when the disease has become chronic because the fluid has lasted for longer than six months. And these are some of the SDOCT biomarkers which will help you to diagnose a case of CSR and differentiate it from other conditions. But why is it that we are so concerned about the fluid in the macula? Normally, the healthy retina is maintained in a dehydrated transparent state so that it is compatible with light transmission. And this subretinal space is just a potential space. It actually does not exist. And this dryness is ensured by a homeostasis between the fluid entry and the fluid exit. 
when any pathology disrupts this, that then only a fluid will accumulate, enlarging the subretinal space. And this can occur due to various reasons that causes an increased inflow, such as anything to do with the vascular permeability of the retinal or the choroidal vessels, or abnormal vessels as a neovascularization, or increase in the permeability of the uh, blood retinal barriers. And similarly, anything which interferes with the outflow, that is either with the RP pump or the molar cells, we can have an exudation in the macular area. So very often we see different diseases which may be diagnosed as CSR. We also see CSR which is referred with a different diagnosis. We'll see more example and learn how to differentiate it. So I'm showing two cases, both with fluid in the macula and both with yellow lesions. The one on the left side on OCT showed fluid, subretinal hyperreflective material and a vacuole sign. FFA showed the classical inkblot type of leak. Octa did not show any network suggestive of CSR with fibrin. On the right side, little more elderly patient, you can see subretinal hyperreflective material, PED. There was a small lazy network which shows increased hyperfluorescence both on FFA and ICGA. Definite network on ECTA showing that this is an AMD with CNBM. And this differentiation is important because the first case responded to laser, whereas the second case required anti vegf therapy. Very often we see that CNBM can exist in both CSR and AMD. Whenever you are seeing an elderly patient, other features of AMD, definitely try to rule out features of CNVM before labeling it as CSR. And again, emphasizing on the point that multimodal imaging is very useful. One more case of subretinal fluid with an yellowish lesion in an elderly man who is on treatment for CSR. But on OCT, you can see apart from the fluid, there is a typical hyperreflective double layer sign, thumb like PED, sub RP hyperreflective material, and pachycoroid. Hotspot on ICGA, definite network on the octa, giving us a diagnosis of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, and he did well with anti vegf therapy. And these two conditions, being two ends of the same spectrum, they can coexist. And here it is a leakage from the neovascular complex that is the reason for the exudation. So our aim is to treat it either with anti vegf or PDT if available. We'll go on to the next set of cases. Here a young man with sudden decrease in vision since one day. Anterior segment was quiet, but fundus showed multiple pockets of fluid, which can be very easily confused with CSR. OCT showed significant SR of as multiple pockets, along with subretinal septa, fibrin, bacillary layer detachment. There were few hyperreflective echoes in the vitreous as well. And FFA showed multiple leaks, which you can see are more leaky and more numerous than what you see in a CSR's case, giving a typical starry sky appearance. ICGA also showed hypofluorescent dark dots giving us a diagnosis of weak age disease. And this is the most common inflammatory condition mimicking CSR, and it is very important because here steroid is the mainstay of treatment, whereas steroids are absolutely contraindicated in CSR. And here it is the inflammation that is leading to the leakage of fluid, that is why steroids help, and this patient did well with treatment. We have a 35-year-old lady with complaints of pain. I am insisting on the point pain, redness and swelling, with a counting finger vision, anterior uveitis, disc edema, choroidal fluids, subretinal fluid, demonstrated very well on OCT. You can see the RP undulations, RNFL edema. With all this, we suspected posterior scleritis, which was confirmed by the T-sign on ultrasonography. And uh, this was further supported by the FFA, showing the disc leak as well as a pinpoint hyperfluorescence. Here again, it is a scleral inflammation and the associated vasculitis, which is the reason for the exudation in the macula and definitely steroid is a treatment. And this patient also did well with good resolution of the macular edema as well as a red disc edema. This is a 55-year-old lady with defective vision for many years with a vision of 612 and 615. You can see, apart from a little fluid in the macular area, there was yellowish lesion bilateral, which was hyper autofluorescent, and the OCT showed this fluid, which can be confused with the CSR. But if you look at the line scan through the lesion, you can see hyperreflective material, making us suspect of a best vitelliform dystrophy. ERG was normal, but EOG showed a reduced Arden's ratio, confirming the diagnosis. And here it is an ionic imbalance in the RPU milieu that leads to the accumulation of the fluid and the vitelliform material. And this patient is remaining stable for years. So this is a situation where you just need to observe and you don't need to make a, another diagnosis and do any treatment. We have a 19-year-old boy who is on treatment for CSR, counting finger 3-meter vision, and you can see significant fluid in the macular area, 
but the line scan through the disc gave us a diagnosis of optic disc pit maculopathy, which is due to a congenital abnormality. And here again, the treatment is observation most of the time. One clue is if you see SRF with intraretinal fluid, then uh, that is one feature of optic disc maculopathy because here the fluid actually enters within the retina, then an outer retinal hole develops and then the fluid comes into the subretinal space. Another anatomical variation that you can see is uh, the dome-shaped maculopathy which can present with features of chronic CSR, but a vertical scan through the uh, macula will cleanse the diagnosis. Here is a patient who is on treatment for carcinoma lung presented with a yellowish lesion with significant SRF, lumpy bumpy appearance on the choroid giving us a diagnosis of metastasis. Here it was relatively easy because the patient was already on treatment for malignancy. We don't have to do any interference because systemic therapy itself gave complete resolution of the fluid. And remember, this is the most common intraocular malignancy, so we might come across these situations. This is an yellowish lesion with again fluid in the macula. OCT showed several horizontal lamellae. I'm sorry, I'll just take one more minute. And ultrasound shows a hyperechoic lesion with shadowing, suggestive of pseudo-optic nerve, and here we are dealing with osteoma. This is again another patient with significant fluid in the macular area. Detailed evaluation showed an orangish lesion above the disc, which was intensely leaky on angiography, giving the diagnosis of hemangioma, and this patient did well with PDT. This is my last case. He's a 10-year-old boy, came with redness and pain, was diagnosed as anterior uveitis on topical steroids, 660 vision. On when we examined, the uveitis was resolving. There was suspicion of very shallow fluid clinically as well as on the OCT. And FFA or ultrasound did not contribute much. We were not sure of the diagnosis. We considered the possibilities of unilateral BKH or posterior scleritis or even masquerade. We started on steroids. Four days later, vision dropped further. The anterior uveitis was not significant, but there was a significant increase in the SRF, which you can make out very well on the OCT. We shifted our treatment to IVMP, still no response. Uveitic masquerade workup, everything was negative. By that time, the child had to go back to his own place, and he then later went on to another hospital. There, they did an examination under anesthesia, and they diagnosed it as regmatogenous RD, and the patient was operated. So not all serous macular detachments are CSR. It can be due to a range of conditions from vascular, inflammations, dystrophies, anatomic abnormalities, tumors, and even regmatogenous RD. So you should suspect when you don't have any risk factor, not resolving fluid and not responding to treatment. And I would also stress on the detailed history, thorough evaluation, and multimodal imaging because a correct diagnosis can only ensure a correct treatment. And it's very important that we are aware of these possibilities because the eyes will not see what the mind does not know. Thank you. Sorry for taking that extra uh, minute. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lekha, for that wonderful uh, uh, you know, case series. And as she's clearly explained to us uh, when uh, to suspect a CSR mimicker and what are the clear signs of CSR on OCT. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Marian is uh, going to take a, a few minutes before she comes with her presentation. So, if you have any doubts, we can, uh, you can take questions. Uh, we discussed uh, mimickers and masquerades in glaucoma, amblyopia, optic neuritis, uh, CSR and uveitis. So, if you have any doubts, please feel free to ask questions. I have a question. What is this bacillary detachment? Uh, that's a new term. Uh, it is a split in subretinal fluid. The fluid is between the neuroretina and the RP that we all know. When there is a split within the myoid zone in the photoreceptors, that is within the photoreceptor layer, pocket of fluid occurs, that is called as a bacillary detachment. And it is uh, like you observe in CSR, in inflammatory conditions like VKH, like there are a lot of conditions which can cause bacillary detachment. You will see a layer above the RPE in the outer boundary. So it is within the photoreceptor layer. So that's very characteristic of... Uh... Uh, any condition with an acute uh, presentation, whether it is inflammation or CSR, all these you can get. Your comments on uh, CSR mimickers. I think uh, one more thing I don't know whether you mentioned best disease. Uh, yeah, it's not. Sir, 
Sir, I would uh, like to know regarding uh, neuro-ophthalmologic conditions, how often you use OCT to uh, follow up these cases? We often do perimetry for uh, their cases. How often is OCT useful? Thank you. As you know, optic disc, I don't rely much on OCT, but RNFL, RNFL definitely I use. RNFL and GCC, as you know, in, in glaucoma I use, but optic disc as such, I don't you use, use it. You use it for following up these cases I, also? You know, some cases like say I, IIH, I would do an imaging so that over time we can show the patient that if there is any improvement or if it's worsening, mainly for those purposes, but not really for the diagnosis. To show, to probably explain to the patient, I would use it, yeah. yeah. Can I add something? Yeah, actually, OCT has a very specific uh, role in uh, neuroophthalmology also. So there are uh, in uh, cases when you are suspicious of a disc edema, but suppose it's very subtle and uh, you can do an OCT and uh, if there is some RNFL edema, which is, uh, again, it adds to your diagnosis, but it should not be the only thing which, uh, you know, makes the diagnosis. For example, optic neuritis is a clinical diagnosis. Patient can have retrobulbar neuritis or papillitis. So if there is an RAPD and a drop in vision, then definitely the diagnosis is optic neuritis. But uh, doing an OCT is also important for prognosis. For example, if you do an OCT uh, and the patient has poor vision and has come to you and you see that the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layer are all normal, you can at least for uh, that time say it's an acute onset event. And uh, you, when, you have, when the patient comes for follow-up, after you have started the patient on methylprednisolone and steroids, uh, you can do a repeat OCT at the end of uh, four to six weeks when you would have, uh, you know, the whole thing would have settled down and patient has recovered the vision. And uh, what we find is that in cases uh, with, there is, a, there is a demyelinating pathology, there is some amount of, uh, in most cases of optic neuritis, there will be some amount of ganglion cell loss, even if the visual acuity has recovered. So that shows that there is some axonal uh, damage which is happening. Uh, and uh, it is like the patient going into a boxing ring and getting a punch, recovering, but there is some trauma which has happened and there is some axonal damage, though the uh, functional visual acuity has recovered. There are some structural changes. So when they say that in MS, even the opposite eye has some subclinical, uh, you know, ganglion cell loss and ganglion cell layer loss is more, more sensitive than a retinal nerve fiber layer loss. We also follow up patients of IIH with OCT nowadays because IIH patients uh, will have disc edema and uh, we will document it with OCT and also doing a GCL at that time. If the GCL is normal then uh, and you start the patient on oral azotazolamide and you follow up next visit. When the retinal nerve fiber layer edema reduces, the RNFL edema comes down. And if the GCL is maintained, you know that, the, of course, there is no uh, definite damage to the uh, optic nerve. But suppose you see that even after the maximum uh, tolerated acetazolamide dose, uh, the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer edema uh, sometimes will appear to have reduced on OCT, but you may find the palace setting in. So in that condition, you may be wondering whether is it due to a, uh, the real, uh, the patient is really responding to the therapy or is it the optic atrophy happening here? Because the disease is progressing and not responding. Then if you do a ganglion cell analysis there and if you get a uh, you know, progressive loss of ganglion cell, then you know the disease is progressing despite your treatment and you may need to either step up your dose of astazolamide or you may need to refer the patient for a repeat lumbar puncture and a surgical intervention. So these are some, uh, you know, uh, some experiences which I have had. You need to do it quite often then, probably yeah. a month once. Yeah. We, we do, we, we do uh, follow up patients with OCT, all patients of uh, optic neuritis, uh, uh, even papilledema of uh, IIH causes, we follow up IIH, yeah. Uh, one month uh, in, and then every uh, three months, at least six months we do, depending on the acuteness of the condition. So I think Dr. Marian is not being able to make it because she is held up in OPL. So we can take some questions if you have any. We still have 10 minutes, I think.
I have a question to Neetu. Sometimes we have patients with, uh, you know, patients who uh, come to us with uh, bod it's suspicious looking disc and they have systemic risk factors of hypertension, diabetes, and you have this real confusion, is it a, a post-AION optic atrophy or is it, a, a is it a subtle glaucoma which is producing? Uh, so, and uh, sometimes I feel in those, anyway, these patients have uh, a vasculopathic risk factors. Is it a good idea to put them on an anti-glaucoma or do you want to wait and look for any definitive dis uh, uh, progression of the visual field changes before you start them on AGM? So, uh, once branded as glaucoma, once you start anti-glaucoma medications for someone, it takes a long time for anyone to stop that treatment. So, and in glaucoma, nothing happens overnight. We have time to decide on whether th there is some actual documented progression. So, unless there is a definite evidence of glaucoma clinically, we do not start any of these patients on medications, unless, of course, intraocular pressure is very high. So we would document these uh, baseline OCT, HFA, and fundus photographs for these patients. And uh, old IONs, typically, if the, it's a disc at risk, it's a smaller disc, there is parallel more than cupping, we would definitely observe. But a larger disc with a larger cup, if the baseline investigations are normal, probably we can follow them up over six to eight months to see if there is any documented change. But having said that, high myopes, family history of glaucoma, thinner corneas, when there are suspicious changes in the fields, patients who cannot come for regular follow-up. So I think it has to be a decision which you have to make after discussing with the patient. But patients who can come for regular follow-up, I wait till I'm sure that there is definite glaucoma before branding that diagnosis on them. So, uh, my next question is to Dr. Divya. So uh, when we have patients with uh, VKH-like picture, what are the investigations we should do other than the ocular investigations? Like you had this patient with uh, uh, leukemia, isn't it? So can you tell us and for the audience, uh, in case of a VK or a VKH like with multiple serous detachments like picture, before you label it as uh, VKH, what are the other investigations you should do? Anyway, VKH patients are a group of patients who might require immunosuppressants uh, with time. So definitely we should get a blood routine uh, done. And uh, this patient, child whom I presented actually because the angiogram finding was not very typical of uh, VKH. So uh, I had seen cases of like uh, hematological uh, malignancies or dyscrasias presenting like neurosensory uh, detachments and uh, CSR like leaks also. So that is the reason why I asked and I think uh, doing a peripheral smear is not uh, like a very expensive test and it is like something which you might pick up. Even in some patients of diabetic retinopathy when you see that some, sometimes you know like uh, that hemorrhages are not very typical of uh, diabetic retinopathy, very superficial like how you see in like uh, hypertensive like splinter hemorrhages and all. So when you see something which is not really fitting into that then get a peripheral smear done because that will pick up many of these uh, underlying hematological malignancies. And if still you have a suspicion, then consider doing a bone marrow. And, uh, you also had a patient with metast metastasis, right? Uh, which presented as uh, uh, the CA breast patient. So are there any uh, like uh, specific imaging features of metastasis? Uh, even clinically also, you know, like when you see these choroidal mass, if you see that, like a clinical picture when you see, if the amount of exudative detachment which you see is more, like when you think in differentials of imangioma, metastasis, metastasis will have more uh, subretinal fluid and exudative detachment. So that is one clinical clue which you can get. And imangioma, usually you will see that uh, in OCT also, the choreocapillaries many times will be just maintained. But in metastasis, you will see that the uh, architecture of the choroid in the uh, OCT will be distorted. And the RP will be hyper-reflective and it will be more lumpy-bumpy in cases of uh, met metastasis. Again, a question regarding the VKH. I don't know if you remember the case I showed you with present with uveitis and discedema. She did not have any retinal lesions at that point. At that point, would OCT, uh, no, clinical, no clinical retinal lesions, just the discedema. And as I said, over 
four years later turned out to be a VKH. So at that point, without clinical retinal lesions, would anything show up on OCT? Uh, in the OCT, that enhanced depth imaging, EDA OCT, you can look at the choroid thickness. So VKH, usually you will have a very uh, thick choroid wherein you will not be able to get the posterior extent of the choroid. So that might be one clue which might be there. Uh, usually because uh, we don't usually do uh, uh, kind of, uh, when we don't suspect uh, VKH, but maybe in this case might, if we had done an EDA OCT, then uh, you can look for the choroidal thickness because uh, VKH patients usually will have thick choroid and uh, instead of repeating the angiogram to follow up these patients on treatment to see whether there is, they are responding, OCT is another useful tool to follow up these patients also. So you will see that eventually the choroidal thickness will also come down. I think OCT is a must nowadays, even for neuroophthalmologists, because many cases which were diagnosed as optic neuritis, sometimes we may miss the subtle sense, uh, serous detachments. The OCT sometimes picks up the multiple uh, serous detachments and retrospectively we have gone and looked into the retina and found that it was VKH and not optic neuritis. Anyway, it will respond to IVMP initially and it will come back with recurrence. So uh, it is a good idea to do OCT whenever, wherever possible. Uh, because you can miss lesions. Just to add on it as uh, even the cases with mimickers like which present like retinitis, whether it is a lymphoma. So in all these cases, wherever possible, get an OCT done because in retinitis, you will see that the inner retinal layers will be affected. When it comes to uh, lymphoma, you will see that it is at the outer retina and the RP, sub-RP level which will be affected. Sometimes in cases of syphilis, you will see that the lesion will be affected more in the outer retina and the RP. So actually it helps to differentiate because earlier before OCT we used to label everything it as subretinal or like choroidal. Now you can clearly make out where is the level of the lesion and that actually help us to come, uh, make, to, come to a uh, diagnosis. And uh, always see, uh, what I see is that when we ask for OCT, if the area of interest is somewhere else, everybody will be happy seeing the macular OCT. So that should not be the point. So whenever you ask for an OCT and when you look for it, don't just see the one single line scan. Always scan the entire uh, the cube which we are doing. So then only you will be able to make out if anything is abnormal at any area. So even when we uh, deal with our normal uh, CNVMs also, you may leave it as uh, inactive. If you just see the single line scan. So always scan, if you don't have an option, go to the machine and see it. So that will help us to uh, give you a diagnosis. So always see the area of interest is scanned, not any other area or the disc or just the macula. Dr. Lekha, you wanted to add something? No, no, I wanted to ask Dr. Divya, can you just uh, maybe you have covered what are the indications for AC tap uh, or when do you do AC tap in patients you suspect masquerade? Suppose if uh, with a known history of UVA it is okay and then if I see that uh, there is a corroborating evidence of posterior sinecae and uh, I mean like if I am suspecting a case of uh, uh, say VKH or anything like that and I see all the classic picture of features of that then I may not do it. But if, when I see that there is okay hypopian which is in a white eye or something like that or if it is a blood stained one then I would like and it, it's not just a hypopion. See, you have to see the history. Uh, that's the reason actually like uh, you have to corroborate between with what the patient presented, what is the history of the patient, what medication the patient has undergone, taken, what surgeries the patient has undergone. In a busy OPD, we tend to miss many of these things. So when you take each one by one, then it will come to you that even before seeing the patient, okay, I need to look at this. So this few clinical clues are this. So when there is a blood tinged one or if it is a very loose hypopen in a white eye and maybe the bilateral presentation and the patient has not responded to your treatment and in inter initially it has responded and then uh, it stopped responding to your medications. So then you think that okay there is something else which we are looking at. That is a point when we think of doing a, a CAC tap. So thank you all. And do we have time uh, for the next, is there a next session going on? Your session. So I think then we will skip it. We'll just have a picture with all the uh, speakers.